then there's me. Charles Coe is a Boston area poet and writer and author of two books of poetry by Leapfrog Press and the author of a novella, Spin Cycles. The short film Peach Pie, which was created by Roberto Maiti, is based on one of his poems, Fortress. And there is also a short documentary about Charles Coe as a poet created by Roberto Maiti, and it's called Charles Coe, Man of Letters. Charles is a winner of a fellowship in poetry from the Massachusetts Cultural Council, and he is presently three year in a three-year term of Artist of Fellow for the St. Boltoff Club that supports arts and humanities in Boston. He has been traveling and providing workshops and poetry readings. He is artist in residence for Boston in 2017. He is working on new writing projects according to his recent film, uh, including his next book of poetry, a memoir, a screenplay, keeping very busy as a writer and in the reaching out, the connecting to community in different ways through what he writes and inspires in others. He is an activist indeed as well as a writer. And he is also a bit of a musician, which he might be telling you or showing you about today. So I am very pleased and honored to introduce to you first, Charles Coe. Good morning, everyone. Cheryl, thanks so much for inviting me, and uh, everyone, thanks for being here. And Mother Nature, thanks for cutting us some slack today. I am so over uh, snow, I tell you. I've lost my snow, Joe, I think. It's all right, wah, wah, wah. Um, I'm going to, uh, given what's going on um, nowadays, I'm not gonna get political, but um, this is just a, a reminder to, to us, uh, to me, to, um, to move through the world in a certain way, I guess I would say. And this is called, If What You Say Is So. Um, this is from uh, my first book, Picnic on the Moon. If what you say is so that this world's heart is cracked and crumbling, I should get ready for the coming round of gray days. I will stand before cracked mirrors, practicing dyspeptic scowls to flash at babies when their mother's backs are turned. When children play outside my window, I will shout down curses like those dry old men who hate life because it reminds them of death. Will you be satisfied then when our eyes are covered with that thin, tough film that lets light neither in nor out? We can sit together then in a cozy little room and wiggle our toes before the fire and sip our tea and laugh at the fools who still believe that a life can be saved by one hand reaching for another. My, um, my next book of poetry, my last book of poetry, All Sins Forgiven, uh, Poems from My Parents, was sort of an attempt to um, sort of address the 10,000 questions I never asked my parents while they were still here. And I know I'm the only one in the room who, you know. But uh, most of the poems are about my parents. This one, this first one, uh, is an exception in, in that it is a, a sort of more general meditation. Um, it's called DNA. The young woman on the bus wearing headphones has a mole on her neck. Perhaps the same mole in the same place on some ancient ancestor, itched with sweat as she crawled on hands and knees through the king's garden, back bent, pulling weeds. I know someone whose husband died a month after their baby's birth. Years later, she had to turn away when her teenage son brushed the hair from his girlfriend's face with exactly the same gesture as the father he had never known. Some mysteries are greater than the birth of stars. That sound you hear the moment before sleep isn't the wind, 
It's your own flesh in a timeless, whispered conversation with itself. Anybody here, um, any parochial school kids here? Uh, okay, okay. Uh, you know, it's funny, you talk to a lot of uh, younger people, and for me, younger people is anybody under 50 at this point. <laughs> And many of them have never seen a, a nun in, in, in full metal uh, jacket. <laughs> and um, that's what I had when I was a kid. Uh, it was an all-black school in Indianapolis, where I'm from, all um, first and second generation, Irish nuns and priests. St. Pat's was the biggest holiday of the year. I mean, Christmas was okay, and yet Easter's cool, yada, yada, yada. But uh, St. Pat's, man. So anyway, this is a meeting of minds. One day when my first grade class was learning to write, Sister Edna took the pencil from my left hand, put it in my right, and told me to keep it there. When I told mother, she said nothing, but the next morning got on the school bus. After morning mass, as children filed into class, she pulled Sister Edna aside and asked, Sister, did you tell my son he can't write with his left hand? Sister Edna replied, she had indeed. Went on to explain that left-handed children have problems developing verbal skills <laughs> and smear, on, smear ink on the page when their hands drag over what they've just written. Mother heard her out, then said quietly, Sister, my son is left-handed. The two women stared at each other a long moment, like convicts on the yard, <laughs> until finally Sister Edna nodded. To this day, I remain left-handed. <laughs> Good for mom. You know, again, young people, don't realize what an amazing thing it was for a young working class black woman to put a beat down on a nun, you know. Because <laughs> if you came home with a mark on your face and your mother said, what happened to you? Well, Sister Edna smacked me. All right, well, whatever you did, don't do it again. Go wash up for supper. So their, their, their rule was unquestioned. This is Five haiku for my father's pot roast. When choosing the meat, father carefully inspects each scarlet treasure. <coughs> On the cutting board, potatoes, carrots, onions, beautiful friendship. Speckled porcelain, bubbling beneath the lid, sweet, fragrant music. Now the meat is served while our eager forks await an introduction. Father's folded hands, the only sound in the room, quiet words of thanks. This one's, um, this one's a little harsh. Uh, but we're all grown-ups here, right? 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 Well, at least you are. I don't know about me. It's another discussion. But uh, every family has its, its legends, its stories, and this is something I never knew about my mother until very late in her life, and she didn't tell me. My sister wound up telling me. This is Riverside Park. Years ago on the north side of Indianapolis was an amusement park where colored folk couldn't go. Now there were no whites only signs. It was understood that the city's Negroes would teach their children how to live inside the dotted lines. One Saturday morning in an act of teen rebellion, my mother and her girlfriends decided it wasn't fair that only white kids could ride a merry-go-round. Without telling their parents, they got on the north side bus to Riverside Park. But when they got off and walked up the driveway to the gate, the white guard stared in astonished rage, shouted, where you niggas think you're going? You know you can't come in here, go on, get! And then as if these words weren't enough, 
He bent to scrape gravel to fling at them, like a farmer shooing crows from his cornfield. Terrified, humiliated, the girls turned to run and left childhood lying on the driveway of Riverside Park. Imagine them on the bus ride home, faces streaked with salt, and ringing in their ears the voice of a man one might be tempted to dismiss as a cartoon cop policing carousels and cotton candy, but one who might have fit in easily with certain distant colleagues who at that moment, after a long day, loading their pale, emaciated charges into the hungry ovens, were sitting to family supper, and in the morning would calmly brush from their cars the fine gray ash that drifted day and night from silent, lead-colored skies. You know, the banality of evil is a term that gets tossed around. Um, did anyone ever see a documentary called Shoah that came out some years ago? It was about uh, um, interviewing people who were living in Poland and thereabouts during the Holocaust. And there was this amazing sequence in a, a barbershop where these old dudes were just standing around. Like, oh, yeah, well, you know, we didn't, we're like, oh, yeah, I mean, oh, yeah. And you, you, you just realize with that phrase, the banality of evil, that, that the things that happened during the Holocaust couldn't happen unless there were people who were like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So not to go down that rabbit hole too far, um, oh, oh, yeah, Cheryl mentioned that there's a, um, a short film that was made based on a poem of mine called Fortress. The, the film is called Peach Pie. Uh, and uh, the poem is Fortress, which I will now read. Mother never socialized with the neighbors. She was polite when they crossed paths, but kept her distance, never visited or invited visits. Only once do I remember a neighbor ringing our bell. Mrs. Glasper, the church lady next door, had just made a load of peach pies, and in the spirit of Christian charity, had come to give our family one. Mother set the pie on the kitchen counter, thanked her and chatted a while, but didn't ask her in. Mrs. Glasper seemed to understand, and after a few more pleasantries, took her leave. While Mother watched her walk across the yard, I watched the pie. It was a beautiful shade of brown, a little darker at the fluted edges. Gold nectar had bubbled up through slits in the crust and burned slightly like caramel. It was still warm. I leaned over and washed my face in the scent of ripe peaches, cinnamon, nutmeg. Mother waited until Mrs. Glasper was back in her house, then picked up the pie and tossed it into the garbage. I don't know how clean that woman keeps her kitchen she said, and without another word returned to the never-ending task of cleaning the already spotless house, the fortress that no one but family was ever allowed to enter. And sort of along those same lines, marksmanship. My mother would sometimes toss off comments that might seem innocuous to observers, but for the intended target were fraught with meaning. Darts dipped in neurotoxin that caused instant paralysis. She couldn't help herself, the way the tongue can't resist the loose tooth. I know now what I didn't know then, that cruelty is the child of fear. But I don't know, will never know, what faceless demons guided her aim as each black feathered shaft struck home. I gotta give my dad a little props here. Sorry to, didn't mean to neglect you, Pops. 
He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. One time, um, my dad called me. I hadn't called home for a while, and my father was saying, you know, you should call your mother or write her a letter. I said, well, you know, uh, yeah, I was writing a letter in my head the other day. And he says, well, why don't you mail your head? <laughs> Very practical man. <laughs> this is for Pop. This is Fort Bliss, El Paso, Texas, August 1951. This is when my father was um, um, stationed uh, stateside during the Korean War. The milk-white sun gazes down like the eye of some implacable lizard. In the photograph, you squint in brand new uniform, shirt too large as if yanked off a shelf and tossed your way after some bored corporal's cursory glance. The cap clings to your buzz cut at the proper angle, but father, you look like exactly what you are, a boy playing soldier. Some barracks buddy, forever anonymous, snaps the shutter. You trade places. Later, send pictures home to mothers who will lie awake because they know that fire and steel love the taste of flesh. I'm going to um, read a couple of um, short, newer pieces, and then I'm going to uh, play a little of that didgeridoo thing over there. Um, and if you, if you need to run or flee, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll accept that, because some people, you know, the, the didgeridoo, um, the accordion, um, you know, bagpipes, they just, I think it's genetic, like some people can't eat coriander, you know, cilantro. <laughs> this is a sonnet for the young woman who offered me her seat on the train. Your smile illuminates the gloomy morn. As sunshine warms a chilly mountain lake, before me sits a beauty not yet born when decades trailed already in my wake. You stir as if to rise and yield your place, but I return your, your smile and shake my head while hoping in the moment that my face will show no hint of all the thoughts unsaid. I could have sung your mother lullabies. Yet still, a young man lingers in my heart, who once delighted in a young girl's sighs. The time has passed for him to play that part. He read his lines upon a perfumed stage, but as they will, the years have turned the page. And this is a conversation with my younger self. Congratulations to you, newly minted grown-up. First solo apartment, boxes scattered about like soldiers exa exhausted after a long march. King Kong poster taped to the wall, a little crooked, now guarding the kitchen. The friends who helped you move long gone. Empty beer bottles, pizza boxes, all that remain. Of course, hooking up the stereo was your first priority. <laughs> and now, Jimi Hendrix roars through these little rooms like a low-flying fighter jet. I peer at you through time's gauze curtain and realize how much I want to say. I want to tell you to go outside and look at the stars because sometimes it's good to feel small. I want to tell you that a woman's love is a precious thing, not just a Saturday night's entertainment. I want to tell you to turn off the stereo and call your mother. I want to tell you all this and so much more, but you can't hear a word I say, because this isn't a conversation. It's the world's oldest bad joke, and I'm the punchline. This white-haired ghost brimming with after-the-fact wisdom on a boat pulling away from shore, sliding through dark water to some destination unknown, hopping up and down on one leg to get your attention, waving my arms and shouting as if what I'm saying actually matters. And maybe you glance up for a moment, 
puzzled by some faint disturbance in the air. As you eat one last slice of pizza off some dead grandmother's thrift shop dinner plate. So um, now I'm gonna I'm gonna honk on that thing for a, a minute or two. This is the didgeridoo. It's uh, from the uh, Australian Aboriginal culture. It's the world's largest. Um, musical or wind instrument, they can trace it back definitely through cave drawings about 3,000 years, but most Aboriginal people and anthropologists say, yeah, yeah, it's more like 20,000 or 30,000 or who knows. So I'm going to do this uh, short little piece uh, I call Meditation for Standing Rock. Volunteering with the Immigrant Mothers. The immigrant mother I work with sits like a good girl in front of the computer. To her, the screen is wallpaper, the monitor, a piece of furniture. Microsoft calls it wallpaper. She doesn't quite take it in. The mothers all have smartphones, but these computers are big and boxy. They take up space. The donated discards have no representation in their lives. How do I convey that a computer is a tool, like a nail file, that what they want to do on one computer, they can do on another? This obedient mother has no idea why she is seated in front of the monitor. Her face is blank. She clicks when I say click here, 
and hunts the keyboard when I ask her to type. When I ask her to save her work, again blank, she hunts why, what can be saved. The save icon looks like a floppy disk, a relic none of these young mothers has ever seen. My student is oceans away from her original home. She types her story as one long sentence. I have two children, Jason and Laura. They go Plimpton school. She knows her story by heart. She doesn't know why she has to tell it to a computer. Facts. Facts are apolitical. Facts are stubborn things. Facts are facts are facts are facts. Facts give not a fig for the fragilities of human beings. strong